Good evening. I'm Dr. George Westlake from Sheffield Family Life Center in Kansas City, Missouri. And in just a few seconds, we'll be on live with both Facebook and YouTube. I know I'm already on YouTube, but Facebook will be caught up here in just a minute. Good evening. I'm Dr. George Westlake Jr. from Sheffield Family Life Center in Kansas City, Missouri. And this is Living Answers for Today. I'm here tonight to answer questions about the Word of God, to help with problems that you might be facing in the Christian life, And if you don't know Jesus Christ, to let you know that he himself is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he's the answer to the complex problems of modern life. Jesus said, I've taken my stand at the door and I'm knocking. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and feast with that person, and that person will feast with me. Do you realize that God created you to have an intimate relationship with him? And when you open your heart to him, and you allow God to do in your life what he wants to do, you are giving God a feast. And then he turns around and makes life exciting for all of us. The whole purpose of life is to know God. That's why we're here. And the only way you can have a living relationship with him is through Jesus Christ. The Bible says, he that has the son has life, and he that doesn't have the son does not have life. The Bible says, as many as receive him, he gives power to become the children of God. So Jesus Christ, if you don't know him, is going to come knocking at the door of your heart to come. When you open your heart to Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter what you've done. doesn't matter where you've been. doesn't matter how many years you've run from God. When you open your heart and receive Jesus Christ, God forgives and forgets every sin you've ever committed, and he declares you righteous. Then he sends his spirit to live on your inside, to help you live as God wants you to live. And that it all comes when you receive Jesus Christ. Christianity is not just a religion, it's a relationship. And that relationship is with the living God through his son, Jesus Christ. Someone asked me, how do you know this religious leader or that religious leader is not the way to God? Well, one thing, before they were born, nobody ever heard of them. But Jesus Christ fulfilled over 300 prophecies of the Old Testament. He was promised in the Garden of Eden. Yes, when God told Eve, your descendant is going to crush the head of the serpent. Not the man's descendant, your descendant. Okay, and Isaiah, 700 years before his birth, behold, the virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son and call his name Emmanuel. And even even Muhammad in the Quran admits that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. And in him was the spirit of the living God. And so Jesus Christ was prophesied how he would be born, how he would die, why he would come into the world to fulfill the prophecies of the Old Testament. And secondly, the reason he came into the world, God is holy. And the Bible says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And because God is holy, he has to judge my sin because I did that. He has to judge your sin because you did that. We were created to know him. Instead, we went the other way. And You know, God has always been Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. At a point in time, God the Son became that helpless baby in a stone feeding trough in Bethlehem's cave. Grew to manhood, never committed a sin. The only man in all of time that never committed a sin. And so God could take the sin of the whole human race and put on him and punish him in our place. That's why when you receive Jesus Christ, it means your sin bill has already been paid. He died for every person all the way from Adam to the last person that will ever live. And if you don't know him, God loves you as if you're the only one he ever had to love. And if you'd have been the only one that sinned, Jesus would have died just for you. So let me encourage you to open your heart to him and start living that abundant life that the Bible talks about in Jesus Christ. And I'll get right into the questions. Again, you can put questions in the comment section on Facebook have a lot of questions that have been sent in, so I'm going to go ahead and get started on these right away. How do we feel the fiery flames of hell when we die? Technically, the brain is dead when death happens. There's no way for the body to send electrical impulses to the to, to, in order that you might feel the flames. Well, in the first place, when you die, your body doesn't go with you. You leave that here. The real you is a soul, and we live in a tent called the body, Okay. And the soul steps into eternity. And also you have a spirit and that goes with you. Your soul spirit goes when you die. And the Bible talks about when the rich man died. He was tormented in flame. Well, that has to be flames to the spirit and the soul. Okay, it has to be flames that you can feel for the real you. And even later on, 
uh, when the dead uh, when the dead that don't know Jesus Christ are resurrected and cast into the lake of fire, they're going to be eternal bodies because the Bible says the worm will not die and the fire will not be quenched. You read at that at that final judgment in the book of Revelation that the beast, uh, who is the false ruler of this world, the one the Bible calls the Antichrist, is pictured in the book of Revelation, which is a picture book as a beast. And he, and he comes against Jesus Christ, and with him there's a false prophet, the person that the world, uh, 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 who controls all the religions of the world and will ultimately cause the, the people of the world to worship the image of the Antichrist. When the beast and the false prophet come against Jesus, when he comes back as king of kings and lord of lords, it says they're cast into the lake of fire. A thousand years later, Satan is cast in, and the beast and the false prophet are still there a thousand years later. And it says, they shall be tormented during day and night forever and ever. So God is going to do something to the resurrected body that will not die, but will be in the place of death forever and forever. And that, that is not a pleasant thought. Uh, how does the principle of tithing apply once a person is living on retirement savings? Well, you made money on your retirement. I, you know, it's an income that you're getting. Uh, I get retirement money, and uh, I pay tithe, tithe and offerings on it, and, and I feel I'm responsible for every dime that I put my hand on, okay? even And uh, so it's retirement savings. You're probably drawing interest on that. And my contention is you can't outgive God. If you're faithful with tithe and offering with whatever you get, you can't outgive God. And the Bible indicates that he will add the true riches in Luke chapter 16. He also says if we're not faithful with what we have, okay, if we're not faithful with finances, God can't give us the true riches. So just let me encourage you to be faithful and watch and see what God does. I remind you, tithing is the only thing in the Bible. God dares you to do it. In the book of Malachi, he, he, he literally says, I dare you to put me to the test. I dare you to bring all the tithe into the storehouse. I dare you to give offerings that my house may be full. And, and God takes up that dare. And so we don't give to get back. We give to help build the kingdom of God. And as I say, you can't outgive God. The Bible makes that patently true. I said, you give, it'll be given back, good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. So my contention is whatever I get, I'm going to give God, God the tithe on it and I'm going to give offerings on it. And that's really what we need to do with it. Uh, okay. Uh, and again, when we're finally cast in the lake of fire, that will be an eternal body because it says that uh, uh, even the worms don't die. And Jesus was very plain about that. Uh, what is the meaning you have not because you ask not? Is that the prosperity teaching comes from? But while James goes on to say you ask and you ask amiss that you might consume you might consume it on your own strong desires. In other words, I just want to be rich so I can buy this and buy this and buy this and do this and do this and do this. No, no, no. No, no, no. And the prosperity gospel is totally, utterly, completely contrary to Scripture. Now, the Bible says in the book of John, I want in all things that you should prosper. But again, prosperity is not necessarily having a lot of money. I remind you in the book of James, it says the poor are rich in faith. That's right. The poor are rich in faith. And let me tell you what Paul tells Timothy about the prosperity gospel. Okay. Boy, if you give to God, you're going to get rich. No, 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 no. And there's some places, I know some preachers that preach, come and accept Jesus Christ so you'll get rich. But let me read from what Paul tells Timothy about the latter days. Okay, and the things that will be going on. All right. Uh, he indicates, they suppose that gain is, well, let me go on. There will be disputers of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, uh, teaching that gain is godliness. In other words, how much money you have, how much stuff you have shows how godly you are. From such turn away. Godliness with contentment is true gain. That's true value. We brought nothing into this world. It's certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, let us therewith be content. They that exercise their will to be rich fall into a temptation and a trap, and many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money, not money, 
The love of money is the root of all evil. Okay, not sin, but all evil, which while some have coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. He says, but you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, meekness, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto you are also called. In other words, this whole prosperity gospel is totally, utterly, completely contrary to Scripture. Yes, God does give back financially, but he does not make everyone rich. And as I've said so many times over the years, God does not have one gospel for first world countries and another gospel for third world countries. He doesn't have one gospel for Kansas City and another gospel for Lomi, Togo, West Africa. All right. He doesn't have one gospel for New York City and another one for Yangon, the capital of Burma. It's actually called Myanmar now. He has one gospel for the whole world. All right. And this prosperity gospel, they tried to teach it in Togo years ago and they laughed them out of the country. And uh, it's just not, it's not scriptural. Yes, God does bless. And he blesses people that will use their finances for the upbuilding of the kingdom of God not just so they can stick it in the bank, all right? Well, why does, you know what Jesus said, stop laying up treasure on earth where moth and rust corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but rather lay up treasure in heaven where moth and rust do not corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If you want to know where your treasure is, look at your checkbook. Okay, look at where your money goes and you can see where your heart is because where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And it's important to give to God. Now, God wants us to take care of our needs. All right. He wants us to pay our bills. Uh, he wants He wants us to take care of our families. But he also says when we put him first with what we have, that he'll make sure we have to do the rest. So uh, there's only one person he ever told to sell everything and follow him. And that was a rich young ruler in the Bible. And he did that because this, you know, those uh uh, this young man went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. In other words, his money was his God. But that's the only person he ever told that, to sell everything you have and give to the poor and take up your cross and follow me. Because his money was his God, as you read the context. And so, but, but God does promise to supply our needs when we're faithful in giving to him. Explain about sins that people deliberately do repeatedly. Well, all sin is deliberate. It's not like I'm walking down the street, whoops, I fell into a sin. All sin is the exercise of our will. Okay, and I tell people the body sins only after the mind sins. Real battleground is the mind. But, 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 but what about sins that people repeatedly do and then ask for forgiveness, knowing that they're going to do it again and again and do keep repeating? Well, they need to make up their mind to quit. You know, God will forgive you, but there comes a line. The Bible warns against the practice of willful sin. <laughs> You know, none of us have arrived yet. We're all going to fail. Matter of fact, you know, First John is writing to Christians when he says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth isn't in us. But he goes on to say, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us, and they keep cleansing us from every unrighteousness. And that's what God does. But if you say, I'm going to do this whether God likes it or not, God, forgive me, but I'm going to do it again tomorrow. Forgive me, but I'm going to do it again tomorrow. Then you need to back off and stop. That's why the Bible tells us in almost every letter in the New Testament, stop doing these things. Stop it. Stop using your members as instruments of unrighteousness. Stop practicing these things that you're doing. Put off your former manner of living. You know, the Bible defines your old man as your former manner of living. It's not that you're half the old man and half the new man. The Bible says if anyone be in Christ in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, they are a new creation. Old things are passed away and all things have become new. So you're not half the old man and half the new man, contrary to some things you read on, uh, you hear on social media, okay? And so, so you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. You have the ability, because the Holy Spirit's within you, to stop doing that, those things. You have the Holy Spirit to start doing the things, but he will not make a robot out of you. If you're going to do something and God says, stop, you turn around, you start to walk away, and the Holy Spirit gives you power to put it into practice. God gives you to do something, you start to do it, the Holy Spirit gives you the power to do it. So, so you can read Ephesians, read Philippians, read Colossians. It tells you, put off your former manner of living. Put it off. 
Put it off like you do a coat. Okay, put it off and put on the new man, which is continuously being renewed in the image of Christ. Yes, you're going to fail, but the practice of willful sin is what the Bible warns us against. Even when it lists the lust of the flesh in Galatians, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, drugging, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murder, drunking, and partying, those that are practicing these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And it's the practice of sin, but you have to learn to draw a line and say no more and walk away from that particular thing, okay? We all have something to fight. The enemy knows where our weakest link is, and the enemy knows how to attack, okay? Uh, what are the seven candlesticks and the lampstands representing the book of Revelation? We are told at the end of the first chapter of Revelation, the seven lampstands, okay, are the seven churches. And he gives us the whole history of the church in the letters to the seven churches. Now, there were seven churches that kind of showed a situation that the Holy Spirit wanted to present. But as you study the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, it's actually the whole history of the church from the day of Pentecost on into the rapture and on into the great tribulation. And when you get to the last four churches, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea, they are all here when the rapture takes place. Let me point out again, the word church is never found after the third chapter in the book of Revelation until the whole story is ended. And in the last chapter, he reminds the church that these things are true that are written in the book of Revelation. But the word church cannot be found after chapter three. The church is in heaven in chapter four and five, saying you've redeemed us by your blood out of every kindred, tongue, tribe, and nation, made us unto God kings and priests, and we shall reign upon the earth. And so it's the history of the church from the day of Pentecost. And when you get to the last four churches, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, they will all be here when the rapture of the church takes place and when the great tribulation begins. And Jesus says to the church at Thyatira concerning those that have the doctrine of idolatry, I will throw you into great tribulation. But the rest of you that don't have this doctrine, hold fast what you have till I come. He gives a promise to the church at Philadelphia. Okay. And I'm sorry, he gives a promise to the church at Sardis where they no longer believe the word of God. Okay, they're away from what the, they're away from what established them. They no longer believe the truth of the word, but he, but he says you have a few people even in Sardis who shall walk with me in white because they are ready. And then the church at Philadelphia, because you've kept the word of my endurance, I will keep you out of that hour of testing, which shall come to test all them that dwell on the face of the earth. So Philadelphia will be, will be gone in the rapture. And then the church of Laodicea, Jesus is standing outside the door trying to get in. I've taken my stand and I'm knocking. That's where he says, if any man will hear me open the door, I'll come in and sup with him. So which church are you in? It's not the name over the door. It's your own personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why he says, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit's saying to the church. Where are you in Jesus Christ? You have idols you're putting ahead of God. Do you really believe the word of God or do you ignore it? Do you, are you faithfully serving God and trying to serve him with the best of your ability, even though you're still human and you might and you will fail? Okay, do you have a church that you attend regularly? Do you hide the word of God in your heart? Okay, you're going to be ready for the coming of the Lord. And, and there are organizations that claim to be Christian. Jesus isn't even in them. So you have to find out. You have to find out. You go where Jesus is being exalted and the word of God is being proclaimed as truth. Okay, you don't pick and choose what you want in the Word of God. You believe what it says. In Genesis 11, it talks about everyone speaking the same language, and God came down and confounded the languages. Oh, was this the start of speaking different languages? If so, what was the reason? Yes, if you read it, you know, God told them to fill the earth. And they said, no, we're going to build us a tower whose top may reach to heaven. And they were probably thinking God might send another flood and destroy us all. So we're going to build a tower whose top will reach to heaven. I reminded when we sent up our satellites years ago and everybody stood and watched them fly through the sky at night. I can remember that the first satellite we sent up. I'm reminded God had to come down to see their tower. And that's when God confounded the languages. And he also separated the continents of the earth. 
We're told in Genesis chapter 10, in the days of Peleg, God separated the earth. Why? Because of the Tower of Babel that's described in the very next chapter. It's an enlargement on that particular event. He separated the continents. He separated the people in different parts of the earth. And he also confounded the languages. And that was the reason for it. man's rebellion against God, united rebellion against God. As you go through the Bible, Babel represents man's organized rebellion against God. I mentioned this last week on the program. When you get to the coming world government, it talks about the worldwide political organization as Babylon. It talks about the worldwide religious organization as Babylon. It talks about the world commercial system as Babylon. And it's going to be under one man and one organization, ultimately one, t- one ten nation organization with the man we call the, the Antichrist. Uh, the mystery of iniquity, the lawless one, the prince that shall come, absolute government rule. And what we're seeing right now in the world governments is a foreshadow of this world government that's coming when you're going to be under control, where you won't be able to buy or sell unless you have the mark or the name or the number. You'll have to be marked in a certain way to be able to even buy or sell. It will be absolute control. All right. Absolute control. And that's going to be coming. And, And you know, we see now a forerunner of it. And that's why in the book of Revelation, it's called Babylon. You have political Babylon, the 10 nation confederacy. You have the worldwide religious system. Okay. And actually the religious system will be administering the mark of the name of the number. Be connected with the worship of the man called the Antichrist. And then thirdly, the commercial system will be connected with that. You won't be able to buy or sell. And and you have an angel fly through heaven in Revelation 16 and says, Babylon has fallen, Babylon has fallen. In Revelation 17, religious Babylon is destroyed. In Revelation 18, commercial Babylon is destroyed, the whole commercial system of the world. And in Revelation 19, when Jesus comes back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords at the Battle of Armageddon, okay, the whole political system is destroyed. And, and Jesus Christ reigns on earth for a thousand years before the new heaven and the new earth. So we're living right there, okay? There's a world shaping up. And what we see now is the forerunner for those things that are going to be coming, going to be coming. Uh, When we know the right answer, okay, and this is an unusual question. When we know the right answer, but, but, but we still ask the question, why would Jesus answer us? Well, sometimes we need a confirmation. Is this the right answer? God, this is the direction I'm going to take. If it's not the right direction, I want you to check me. As a matter of fact, I've told people over the years, sometimes you have to make a decision okay, and decide this is what I'm going to do and ask God, if it's not your will, you check me and let me not feel peace about it and help me to know the right decision to make. And I've seen God do that time after time. Sometimes you have to make the decision. And that's what this says here. Okay, okay why would Jesus answer us if we're making the right decision? He will uh You know, if we take time to ask him, okay, if you feel peace about making that decision, you can count on the peace of God. You can count on the peace of God. But if you feel uneasy about it, then you better double check. When we know the right answer, but we act by our instinct as an example of operating in the flesh. No, not necessarily, because God gives us wisdom, okay, and we can make a decision about something. But then we say, God, if this is not the right decision, especially if it affects other people. If it affects other people, you have to be very cautious about decisions. An example of operating the flesh. Uh, when we act before Jesus answered, can we hurt others? Yes. Yes, but, but, but we can make a decision. Again, we can make a decision to do something and ask him to take peace from us if that's not the right decision. And he will do that. Okay, he will absolutely do that. And I've decided to use these on long sheets the last few weeks to save cutting them up. Uh, In Romans 13 and 1 Peter 2 and 9, talks about honoring government authority because no authority is in place except which God has placed. And honor the emperor. Does this mean we are supposed to honor and obey ungodly leaders like Hitler? Now, the answer I give to that, you can read that in Romans chapter 13, especially it goes on and on. As a matter of fact, on Wednesday nights, I've been on... uh, uh, Last week I was in Romans chapter 13, and we're going to be in part of it tomorrow night where it says knowing the time, that now it's high time to wake out of our sleep. And I'm going to talk about what time is it. Okay, high time to wake out of our sleep. I'm going to use Matthew 24 and some of the other passages. But but in Romans chapter 13, 
Let every man, every soul be subject unto the higher power. There's no power but of, of but the powers that be are ordained of God. Wherefore, whosoever resists the power resists the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. We will then not be afraid of the power. Do that which is good, and you shall have praise of the same. He is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do that which is evil, be afraid, for he bears not the sword in vain. He is a revenger of... <laughs> Uh, he is a minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath. We have to be needs for, not only for wrath's sake, but also for conscience. Now, now, for this cause, he goes on to say, pay taxes. Okay, pay your tax and also your final tax, which is like a sales tax. He uses two words for taxing. And the answer I give to this is when they ask Jesus, is it lawful to pray, pay tribute to Caesar? Now, they tried to trap him. If he said no, Rome would arrest him. If he said yes, the Jewish religious leaders would see say he's worthy to be stoned. But Jesus always gave the right answer. Bring me a coin. Whose image is on the coin? Caesar's. He said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. Government, as long as it doesn't disagree with this book. When it disagrees with this book, no, that is not Caesar's. That's God's. And the particular illustration I mentioned, I hate to wear a seatbelt. The main reason for that is many years ago, I had my seatbelt fastened and someone rear-ended me and the seatbelt shredded my rotor cuff and I ended up having to have rotor cuff surgery and had to walk my arm up and down the wall and I had to pick this arm up to put it on the steering wheel of my car. And I hate seatbelts because I'm, you know, my shoulder is still a little irritated even after all those years. But the law says wear a seatbelt in Missouri. And that's not something that's a matter of spiritual content. That's not something that has to do with the word of God at all, other than the fact that I'm supposed to obey it. And so I obey that law. But if they tell me I can't preach the truth of the word of God, and I can't call sin, sin, that is not Caesar's to determine. That's mine. That's God's to determine. And so when it comes to a choice of having to obey God or having to obey the law, you have to obey God first, but be sure it's based in Scripture. You see, the book of Acts shows us as you go through it that the Christians were never accused of breaking the civil law. Then why did they get persecuted? Well, the Jews persecuted them, first of all, primarily. I read the book of Acts. They were the first persecutors of the church. They even went to other cities to bring accusation against them. Uh, the and and the thing that the Christians started getting killed for, they refused to say Caesar is Lord. Okay, Sar Kurios. They would say Yesu Kurios, Jesus is Lord. Or they would say Kurios Jesus, Lord Jesus. But they refused to say Kurios Caesar, Lord Caesar. That's why they were executed. That's why they were killed. They refused to make Caesar as Lord instead of God. So that's where you have to draw the line. That's where you have to draw the line. And so if something is contrary to the word of God, then you have to do what you can. You know, it's amazing the number of Christians that were hiding the Jewish people uh, when Hitler was trying to kill all the Jews. A number of Christians were hiding them. And, was, uh, and uh, you have to try to help. You have to try to help. So it's, it isn't always easy to draw the line. But, but again, you have to know what Scripture says and what the Scripture of teaching is. God will not have you violate the principles of Scripture. But you render unto Caesar with Caesar's, unto what God's with God. And he says here, pay your taxes. I've heard some people say taxes are contrary to the Bible. No, they're not. He actually uses two words for tax here. I wish they were contrary to the Amen. Bible, but they're not. And so you have to pay your taxes, too. He uses two taxes. The first one has to do with an I would have been the Roman tax, and the other one was a final tax. The word is telos, the end tax. It would be like a sales tax, okay, or something like that. So you do have to pay it. But, uh, but you render unto Caesar, Caesar, and unto God was God. Read your Bible and know what you're supposed to do. There's some things that, that are popular that people think it's okay to do that I don't, and some people that I think are okay to do and they don't. And so you have to be fully persuaded in your own mind about what the Bible says is God's and what the Bible says is Caesar's. And that's not always very easy to determine, okay? And then another question that I get so frequently, 
and I got it again this week. I answered it a couple of weeks ago, I believe. I, I, and this person says, I'm 100% for women pastors. Uh, where biblically is this backed up? There is plenty of social media against it, okay? Against it. And uh, you have to look at that passage in First, uh, in First Timothy where Paul says, I suffer not a woman to teach nor usurp authority over a man, all right? But you have to go back and look at the background. Gordon Fee, who's one of the greatest scholars in the history of Christianity, he's the general editor of the International Comment of the International New Testament, a New Testament Commentary, and he took the place of F.F. F. Bruce, and he is one of the greatest Greek scholars that we have in our history. Um, uh, uh, he makes a statement: the hardest thing to determine in Scripture, in what was particular for that church. And what is universal truth? For instance, whatever the Corinthian did with uh, the Corinthian women did with their hair to indicate there were married women. Okay, we don't know exactly what it was. It's got nothing to do with women having long hair. You have to read the text and see what's going on there. And it is not a universal thing. There was something the Corinthian women did with their hair that indicated they were married women. And because God was using them to prophesy, they were doing something with their hair that made them look like they were no longer let married women. I no longer have to follow the leadership of my husband because God is using me to prophesy. It'd be the equivalent today of a woman taking off her wedding ring. That's the principle, but we don't know what it was with the hair, and no one seems to know exactly. It's actually a head down covering is what it says. Uh, so, uh, so a lot of us believe the Corinthian women braided their hair in a certain way. Now, I know you go further down the passage and says, if a man has long hair, it's a shame. If a woman had long hair, it's a glory. But he says, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. Don't forget that verse. So he's not just talking about long or short hair. All right. But he indicates there is a distinction between a married woman and a single woman. And when it says, it actually says the woman can prophesy as long as she has her as long as she's married, okay, and if she has her hair like a married woman, okay, she has authority on her head. It does not say she's under authority. That word is not used passively. She has authority on her head because she's acting like a married woman, and God is giving her a prophecy so she, she, she can be free to give it in the church. And uh, but, 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 but the idea of the hair was a local thing. But well, when, you read, uh, when you read Acts chapter 20, Paul calls the elders from Ephesus. And they come to him and he greets them and he outlines their responsibility, being shepherds over the flock and being the overseers of the church. The elder was also the pastor. Okay, all three titles refer to the same person. They were to oversee the church. They were to feed the flock. And that's the pastor because the word translated pastor is the Greek word shepherd. They were to oversee the church. That was their responsibility. And they are, to, and they are the elders of the church. They have the respect due. And so, so he calls them all that. And then he says, from among your number, meaning from among the pastors, there are going to rise false teachers to draw disciples after themselves. All right. And you read the first chapter of 1 Timothy. Paul said, I left you at, at Ephesus to, to make them stop teaching false doctrine. All right. So apparently what had happened as you read the scripture, these false teachers had got some of these women after themselves to follow them, and they were sending them out teaching false doctrine. And the women but were usurping Timothy's authority as pastor, because as pastor, he is to determine the doctrine, the teaching of the church. That's one of his responsibilities, what is taught in that church, okay? What goes forth from the pulpit, what goes forth in the classroom. And so these women were usurping his authority by teaching false doctrine. And the key word there is usurp. If God appoints his woman as pastor, she is not usurping anybody's authority. Okay. And some of the greatest pastors around the world are women pastors that God has used to build great churches where literally thousands of people have been saved. All right. And then there's something else I want to point out in first Timothy. I, uh, you know, if you read Romans 16, it indicates that Paul says, uh, he mentions Phoebe, and he actually says she was a deacon of the church at Centria. And I was reading one comment that someone made about that. Well, actually, she was a deaconess, and the word 
Uh, and the word diakonos, diakonia for the feminine just means to be a servant. Well, Paul doesn't use the feminine for her. He calls her a diakonon, which is masculine. All right. He uses the masculine form of the word. She is a deacon of the church, meaning she has an official capacity in that church. In the same chapter, he says, salute Andronicus and Junia, my relatives who were in Christ before me, who were noteworthy among the apostles. That does not mean the apostles paid special attention to them. It means that among those called apostles, they are particularly noteworthy. And Junia is a woman's name with a woman's ending. It is a woman's name, Junia. Uh, a man named Junia was worse than a boy named Sue. And people say, well, I read one report and they said, well, there was, no, no, it means masculine or feminine because there was a bishop of, I was a bishop in Rome that took the name Junia. Well, he took it from the Bible and he called himself Junia. That doesn't mean 300 years before it was a masculine name. Okay, he was, uh, uh, he lived in the 300s AD and gave him, uh, 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 he picked out a name from the Bible and gave to himself. And he obviously didn't know what he was doing, so he called himself Junia. But uh, even Chrysostom, one of the early church writers, he indicates that this is a woman apostle, same way Barnabas is called an apostle. They weren't one of the 12, but they're one set with a special commission. I think a modern day missionary is a modern day apostle. They go to other countries, they establish churches, they encourage believers. And I know great women missionaries around the world. I've met them in different countries I've been in. I've met great women pastors here and all over the world. And, uh, and God is blessing them. Uh, you know, Miriam is called, called a prophetess. In the Old Testament, Junia is called in a prophet, called a prophetess. Okay. Uh, and then let me throw a couple more things at you. You know, God has always used, has always used women. And then also in Galatians, Paul says in Christ Jesus, there's neither male nor female, bond nor free. All right. And there's a great article by one of the professors at Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, California, a highly respected New Testament scholar who wrote a, a, a three page with four column article on that, indicating there is no distinction between men and women in any kind of ministry. God can use both for any kind of ministry. And then something else that one of my Greek students pointed out to me that I had never caught over in 1 Timothy. And they asked me a question about it. And I took a look at it and thought, wow, it, it, you know, that's absolutely right. Uh, over in 1 Timothy chapter 3, our Bible says, uh, uh, if a man desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. But the, the word bishop uh, is usually episkopos, which is masculine. But here he uses episcopes, which is feminine. And then where it says he is desiring, the same verb can be translated he, she, or it, depending on what the main word is, what the, the, okay, what the subject of the sentence is. So, so just as correct a translation would be, 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 if a woman desires the office of a bishop, she desires a good thing, okay? And actually it reads if anyone, because the Greek word is tis, and that can be either masculine or feminine, okay? The office desires, the, and that's the overseer. They desire a good thing. And then typical, though, you know, of Indo- of Indo, of Indo European languages, if they're talking about men or women doing the same thing, they will always use the masculine voice. That's the nature of the language. Okay, that, that's the grammar of the language. In other words, even in French, you can have 500 women and one man, you'll still use masculine pronouns, masculine verbs, masculine adjectives. So then he goes on to describe a bishop must be the husband of one wife. And there in verse two, it's episcopos, it's masculine. So he's talking about both positions by using the masculine voice. And then when you get down to verse, when you get down to verse 11, where it's talking about deacons, our King James Bible says, likewise, their wives, the word there is not in the Greek text. Okay. And the word gune can be either wife or woman. In French, femme can be either wife or woman, depending on the context. 
And so the correct translation should be likewise the women. Women what? The women deacons. All right, likewise the women. There is no possessive pronoun saying there, belonging to them. Likewise the women. But then he goes on to use masculine pronouns to describe the job. But it affects both men and women. And we, we read a lot of times, we are the sons of God. Well, the word means a legal heir who's reached the age to make decisions. And I tell you, I tell the Christian ladies that you are sons of God too, because you're just as much heirs as the men are. But it uses the masculine continually to describe mixed company. That's the nature of Indo-European languages. So uh, to me, it's very obvious. Junia is an apostle. All right. And Phoebe is a deacon, okay, of the church of Centuria. And again, he uses the masculine form, diakonos. Okay. And if you wanted to say deaconess, you would have said diakonia, but he said diakonos. And that's the accusative case, so it's diakonon, but it's but still masculine. And uh, so God uses women the same. In Christ Jesus, there's neither male nor female, bond nor free. Now, I don't know if Fuller Seminary still has that on their website or not, but it's a great discussion of women in the ministry, women in the ministry. And I've, I've been privileged to be with so many women pastors around the world that are doing a tremendous work for God. And most of them have very strong men as husbands. Most of the ones I have met have very strong men as husbands. Okay. And yet they're, they are still the senior pastor of the church. And it just does great. It just does great. Okay, let me take some more questions here. Again, you can send questions in, uh, you know, by the comment section on Facebook. And uh, your question is never dumb, so please send some in. We like to get live questions, too. And Pastor Mark is here, and he'll mark them down. We've only had one so far tonight. I hear scholars debate as to whether the mark of the beast is an actual marking in the skin or if it's something invisible or symbolical. I think it's something can be obviously seen as called a writing on the skin is what it's called. Okay, a writing on the forehead of the skin. Now, I'm sure it's also a foot. You know, it's also indicating since Revelation is, is a picture book, the government's going to control your thinking, and the right hand is considered the hand of action. Okay, going to control your thinking and your actions. But it's obviously going to be something visible. It might be... It might be a microchip. It might be something in the skin, but it will be something that that that, uh, that electronics can pick. Excuse me, can pick up on. Because they're talking now about having to have a card or having to have something to show you have have the shot if you're going to travel. And there are some countries now even throwing people in jail if they don't have it. And I just heard the last couple of days about one country. Uh, they're actually making supermarkets. Uh, if you go shopping at a store, you have to use your credit card. And they want to track. They want to keep track of how many groceries individual people are buying, individual families are buying, and the government control one nation that are putting people in jail if they refuse to take the shot. And this is this is coming, folks. This is just a forerunner of what's coming, and the Bible talks about it all the way through. So we have to look up and look because our redemption draws near. Uh, you can't set dates. Watch out for the date setters. Jesus said it's not for you to know. Okay. But it's going to be an actual mark. It may be on the skin. It could possibly be a microchip because they have microchips they can read now. There's a company that advertised years ago they could keep track of a billion pets from satellite with a microchip. Well, if they can keep track of a billion pets, they can keep track of a billion people. Okay. Uh, with the world in such disarray, it doesn't seem like Jesus is currently ruling as King of Kings and Lord of Lords in the affairs of mankind. In Revelation 1.5, it says Jesus is the ruler of the kings of the earth. Is his kingdom here now and ruling on earth, or does that happen when he returns again as King of Kings and Lord of Lords? It's both and. Uh, I like the statement that was made years ago. The kingdom is now, but not yet. Those of us that know Jesus Christ, we are part of the kingdom of God. What God is doing in Israel is part of the kingdom of God. 
people that are being saved all over the world, the kingdom of God is there. I've told our people in church, wherever you go, the kingdom of God is there because you're part of that kingdom. But it's not yet. He is coming back as king of kings and lord of lords, and ultimately he is going to rule. And he is allowing things to go on right now that they are. Uh, he's still in control because the things we're seeing now have been prophesied in the word of God, that it's going to be like this in the latter end time. So when he returns as king of kings and lord of lords, and it says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But God's plan is still taking place. And so he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. Again, the kingdom of God is now, it's right here, wherever you are. If you know Jesus, the kingdom of God is right there. The kingdom of God is right here because we're here. The kingdom of God is right where you are if you know Jesus, all right? But the kingdom is now, but not yet. It, it, it's coming in its fullness, but it's now, but not yet. And that, that, that's what Jesus told them in his day. He said, the kingdom of God is among you. And he meant the fact that he was there among them. And the kingdom was there. So wherever the king's citizens are, okay, they are there. And so you let the, you, you let your kingdom make uh, you let your kingdom character shine in this day. We have to let people see the love of Jesus in this day. We have to let people see that we care about them. We have to let them know, no matter what they've done, where they've been, God loves them as if they're the only ones He ever had to love. And they're as important to God as anybody that ever lived on the face of the earth. How do we do that? But the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control, described in the book of Galatians. Jesus gave two commands, and they're referred to again you know, in Romans chapter 13. We're to love God and love our neighbor as ourselves. And who's your neighbor? Everybody. There is no excuse to mistreat another human being. There is no excuse to mistreat another human being. Okay. Now, when the book of Acts is mentioned, a cluster of issues spring to mind, including speaking in tongues and baptism with the Holy Spirit, church government and practice, missionary methods and strategies. How does this chronicle of the early church relate to the rest of Scripture? Well, it tells you uh, what the churches were like that the scriptures are written to. It describes the events. It tells us what God had, was doing in the early church and what he wants to continue to do today. Uh, the, the idea that speaking in tongues, it did not stop in the days of the apostles. The baptism with the Holy Spirit did not stop in the days of the apostles. And you read that in the book of Acts over and over, and you go to the book of 1 Corinthians, and it explains it. It explains the manifestations of the Spirit. It explains on the day of Pentecost when they spoke in other tongues, in Acts chapter 10 when they spoke in other tongues, in Acts chapter 19 when they spoke in other tongues, what that was all about, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. It gives you the lowdown on that. It gives you the lowdown on what it means to be born again, to be born again. Are we still on okay? Okay, it says check your internet connection. Okay. Action needed. Check your internet connection. You're going to see delay of five seconds. Okay. And so, I, you know, the New Testament shows us how those things are appropriate today. Uh, church government, it talks about deacons. It talks about apostles, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Okay. And the fact that everyone has a ministry. And it gives a missionary method of carrying the gospel. It shows how, how they fulfilled the Great Commission, carrying the gospel under the ends of the earth as far as they knew it. Okay, in their day, Jesus knew what the ends of the earth were, but they didn't. They, they just thought the Roman, Roman Empire was the whole world. And they had to learn differently. But you read the rest of the scripture, and it applies those principles in the book of Acts to everyday living within the church. It applies the teaching of Jesus to everyday living within the church. And you can read the book of Acts and see how the teaching of Jesus took place in everyday living in the book of Acts as they carried the gospel all over the Roman Empire. And it's amazing, amazing the way it all fits together. And so don't ignore the Acts of the Apostles. It ought to be called the Acts of... Uh, you know, when Luke writes a... Uh, he'd written the Gospel of Luke, and this is part two, because he addressed the Gospel to Theophilus, who was a Roman official, 
And then in Acts, he says, a former, I said, a former letter have I written, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day that he was taken up, after he had given commandments to his disciples and so on. So the book of Acts ought to be called what Jesus is continuing to do through the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I mean, uh, what Jesus is continuing to do <laughs> through his body, the church, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, because he calls the gospel what Jesus began to do. The book of Acts is what Jesus is continuing to do through his body, the church, by the power of the Holy Spirit. That ought to be the name across the top instead of, you know, the Acts of the Apostles. Okay, the titles at the top of the page were not in the original. Okay, don't forget, the titles at the top of the page were not in the original. And so uh, you can get a lot of understanding from the book of Acts. Uh, Colossians 3, 18 to 25, sounds sexist, racist, promoting slavery and revenge. The church down through the years has been criticized for what Paul wrote here. What is this passage really saying? How we how should we defend this passage to, crit to critics? Okay, let me go back over here to Colossians. And uh, don't forget, you're talking about a culture that that that, 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 that that, that happened 2,000 years ago plus. And slavery was a real concept in the Roman Empire. It was something where slaves were accepting the Lord. How should they act in their position? And so he had to deal with that. And I don't forget, back in that day, women were not giving formal education. And the Bible does teach the man is to be the leader of the house way back in Genesis, okay, all the way through. But to be the leader, not the boss, the leader of the house. And it tells the wife is to respect her husband. And Paul says in Ephesians, a man is to love his wife as Christ loved the church and give himself for her as Christ gave himself for the church. And when I do a wedding, I remind them that joy is putting Jesus first, each other second, and yourself last. Jesus first, each other second, and yourself last. That marriage is 100% giving, not 50-50. It's 100% giving of self. God so loved the world that he gave. What did he give? The best that he had. So agape love is that 100% giving of yourself. And that's what creates a good marriage. And the Bible teaches a man, a wife should respect her husband. The Bible teaches the man should respect his wife and love her as Christ loved the church, give himself for her. And if you read Ephesians, where Paul gives basically the same kind of description, he says, submit to one another. Okay, submit to one another. And so I will read this because this is where the question is. Wives, keep submitting yourselves to your own husbands as it is proper in the Lord. Now, if your husband asks you to do something that's not proper in the Lord, no. Husbands, love your wives. And again, Paul adds in Ephesians, and give yourself for her as Christ gave himself for the church. And don't be bitter against them. Okay, and that's the present imperative. Stop it. Stop it. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Now, this means children. Okay, it doesn't mean adults. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Okay, you can be too strict with children. You can be too strict. There was a family in the church many, many years ago. I've been at the same church 49 years. So this was way, way, way back, about the time Noah built the ark, I guess. And uh, and they had two daughters, and they were so strict with them. And I kept telling them, I said, when your daughters get old enough, they're going to run away from home. And both of them ran away from home because they were too strict with them, too strict, unless they be discouraged. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service, not as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, serving God. Now you're stuck in that position. Okay, now some people that were slaves, some people that were slaves were indentured slaves. In other words, I owe you a million dollars and I don't have it to pay. And you tell me, well, how about working for me for 10 years and I'll cancel the million dollars. And they were indentured slaves. But you read, you read about slavery in the Old Testament, okay, and you had to treat a slave as a member of the family, as a member of the family. You had to make sure they were taken care of. 
And let me go on and read. For whatsoever you do, do it hardly as unto the Lord and not unto man. Knowing of the Lord, you shall receive the reward of inheritance for your serve the Lord Christ. He that does wrong shall receive the wrong which he has done, and there is no respect of persons. Owners, give unto your servants that which is proper and equal, knowing that you also have a master which is in heaven. So, uh, so don't forget the first verse of the next chapter. I hate the chapter divisions in the Bible. Don't forget, these were continuous letters. That's why I encourage people, when you read the Bible, ignore the chapters and verses. Uh, you know, read through the book. Like, you know, this is first. Uh, this is first Timothy. If I was studying this, I'd read it through about five times like a newspaper, then go back and read it slowly. And that's, that's the way to study any passage of the Bible. This is Colossians, excuse me. And that's the way to study any passage of the Bible. Uh, when I took the Pentateuch in Bible college, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, we had to read each book of the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and also Deuteronomy, each one 50 times. And each time had to be at a single sitting. If you got interrupted, you had to start over. It had to be at a single sitting. We had to certify, we read Genesis 50 times like a newspaper at a single sitting each time. The same with Exodus, the same with Leviticus, same with Numbers, the same with Deuteronomy. When we got finished, we knew the Pentateuch. Okay, and that's still the best way to study the Bible. Read, read a book like a newspaper, read it five times, and then go over and read it through slow. I don't recommend 50 times, but go through and read it slow. I thought I was never going to get through that course. <laughs> that, was, that, that, that was really about the time Noah built the ark, folks. And But, 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 but slavery was a matter they had to deal with. Now, Paul points something out. Uh, uh, okay, okay, he points something out. Let me turn over here. I'll get here where I'm going in a second. I have to get past Titus. My things stick together on me. Uh, the little letter of Philemon. Now Philemon's only one page, but let me let, uh, let me give you the background for the book of Philemon. Now slaves were a piece of property under the Roman Empire. And they were usually branded. You know, the Bible talks about our conscience being branded with a hot iron. Only two kinds of people were branded in New Testament times, slaves and criminals. Oh, what did Paul mean when he said our conscience can be branded with a hot iron? Well, the slave thinks I haven't got any choice. I can just do this. I can do that. I can't help it. I just can't help sinning. I'm just a slave of sin. Yeah, we have our conscience abandoned with that kind of a brand. I just can't stop. Or else, I'm a, or else I'm a criminal. I have the right to hurt you. I have the right to kill you. I have the right to damage you. And they get their conscience branded with either mark of a slave or a criminal. But, but slaves were branded. So, if, you know, someone was a runaway slave. And again, a lot of slaves were indentured slaves. All right. Now. Paul was in prison, and he met a runaway slave named Onesimus. And he had belonged to a man Paul had led to the Lord, okay, called Philemon. And so Paul is going to send this slave back to Philemon. Now, Paul had to use money in order for that to happen, okay? In order for a slave to be set free, someone had to accompany him back to Philemon. So here, here again... Onesimus is going to show up at the door of Philemon with someone accompanying him from the Apostle Paul, but he also has a letter from the Apostle Paul. So here is this runaway slave. Now, under Roman law, he could kill him. He could do anything he wanted with him. But now Philemon is a Christian. So how is he to treat this runaway slave? Paul, a slave of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, under Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer. And to our beloved, uh, I'm stammering, our beloved Aphia and our Chippus, okay, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Now he goes on to indicate here that I hear of your love and your faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and all the saints. 
okay, that the communication of your faith may become effectable in the acknowledging of every good thing that you in Christ Jesus. What's he saying? Uh, uh, that sixth verse uh, is very hard to express in English. And what it means is, as you share your faith with other people, it will remind you of your own faith and build your faith up. As you verbally share your faith with other people, it will help build your faith up and remind you of all the blessing of serving God. Okay? And he says, I have great joy, brother, because the bowels of the saints are rejoiced by you. Now, he says, I might be bold for what I'm asking, but I'm asking for love's sake. I beseech you, being such a one as Paul, the aged, and a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I'm in prison, and I'm getting old, okay? I beseech you for my son, Onesimus. Now, Paul only called three people his sons, Timothy, Titus, okay, and, and also Onesimus. I beseech you, I beg you, for my son, Onesimus, uh-oh, whom I have begotten in my bonds. He became my son because I was a prisoner, and he was which in times past was unprofitable. And the word Onesimus means profitable, but he became unprofitable. But now he is profitable again to you and to me, whom I have sent again, therefore receive him who is from my own bowels, not from my own heart, whom I would have to retain with me that in your place he might minister to me in the bonds of love. In other words, he was in prison helping me. He's young and I'm old, okay? And he was actually taking your place in helping me. But without your mind, I would do nothing. In other words, I wanted to hang on to him, but I thought I'd better send him back to you, okay? But, and I did that not of necessity. I want you to send him back to me, not of necessity, but willingly. Perhaps he therefore departed for a season that you should receive him forever. Why? He met Jesus Christ. Okay, now he's a brother in Christ. He left you for a season that you might receive him for over. Receive him now, not as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved. In other words, you can no longer treat him as a servant because he's a brother Christian. Especially to me, how much more to you and in the flesh in the Lord. If you account me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. If he has wronged you, or owes you anything, put that to my account. I have written it with my own hand. I will repay it. I wouldn't think of reminding you that you owe me your own soul. I like that phrase in there. I led you to the Lord too. Yes, brother, let me have joy in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. Having confidence that I wrote unto you, knowing that you will do more than I say. Now, what did he say? Send him back to me. What's more than I say? Set him free. You can't keep him as a slave. He's a brother in Christ. That's yeah, as far as I know, Onesimus and Onesiphorus are the same person. Yeah. yeah. My friend said the sons of God were descendants of Seth. Is that was so? Did they die in the flood? If so, why? Uh, yeah, some of them did. And all the descendants of Cain died in the flood. Well, well, I guess they got contaminated too. It says when the, when the sons of God saw the daughters of men, okay? And again, the sons of God are not demons. That is a, that is a totally false teaching. The demons are fallen angels. They are spirits. Jesus called them unclean spirits. Spirits cannot reproduce. Angels only appear as men. They are not men. They cannot reproduce. The Bible calls angels ministering spirits. Okay. In the book of Hebrews chapter one, ministering spirits sent to those who are heirs of salvation. And, and Jesus taught clearly that, that when you die, you'll be like the angels of God, which neither marry nor are given in marriage. And it says they took them wives. The sons of God took wives of the daughters of men. It's obviously the godly line of Seth intermarrying with the ungodly descendants of Cain. And they became polluted instead of converting the descendants of Cain to serve God. They became polluted. And it goes on to say, my spirit will not always strive with man. The imagination of their heart is evil continuously. And so God was going to send the flood. But he found a man of renown. 
Uh, he, you know, it says he became giants. The word is Nephilim. Well, how big is a giant? Goliath could have, uh, the tallest he would have been with nine and a half feet. If you, and that's if you take a 36 inch, uh, uh, if you take a 36 inch cubit, but if you take a 30 inch cubit, he'd have been a lot shorter. So we don't know. Uh, he wasn't as tall as a basketball goal. And, uh, I mentioned before, my wife was only four foot ten, and we got on the elevator in Honolulu one time at the Pro Bowl with two tall Jones from the Dallas Cowboys. She came up to his belt buckle. He was a giant as far as she was concerned. And imagine if somebody that big gets on an elevator with Shaquille O'Neal. That's exactly the same way. They were just giants. They were bigger than them. And it's only used twice. It's used there, and it's used when the spies were in the land, and they saw the Nephilim, the giants. But... Uh, It actually says there were giants in the land, men of renown. And my professor used to say they were spiritual giants because, and again, Stanley Horton, one of the top 10 Hebrew scholars in the world. Why did he say spiritual giants? Because the usual idiom for Hebrew is men of renown is men of a name. And we translate it men of renown, men who have made a name for themselves. In this case, it's men of the name. They became Nephilim of God. Such a one was Noah, who found favor in the eyes of the Lord. He was a man of the name. The name in the Bible is always God's name, especially in the Old Testament. Uh, what is the difference between a prodigal and an apostate? Can they both return to faith? It's doubtful that the apostate ever will. Now, I remind you, the prodigal son started out at home, and he ended up in the muck, muck, muck and mire of the pig pen and riotous living. OK, wasted all of his substance, everything about himself. He said, my father's servants are better. I'll go back to my father. He knew where to go and he came back to his father. All right. I've sinned against heaven and against you. No more worthy to be called your son. But I noticed when he returned, the father ran out to meet him. And if you if you walk away from Jesus Christ, you come back to him. He'll run out to meet you tonight. He'll run out to meet you and put his arms around you. He wants you saved. The Bible says God is not willing that one soul should perish. We are told that twice in the New Testament. So God hasn't willed anyone to hell. Not anyone. He's willed everyone to heaven. And it's up to us. It's up to us. Okay, okay, okay. okay it's, uh, it's up to us to decide what's going to happen. I just dropped a bunch of questions on the ground. I'm sorry. I got to pick them up and make, and make sure I answered this one. Okay, I answered that one. Now, so, so the prodigal can go back home. He still knows the way. The apostate no longer believes Jesus is the way of salvation. That's Hebrews chapter 6. It's impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made sharers of the Holy Spirit and tasted the word of God, good, and the powers of the world to come, good, and fell away. It's impossible to renew them to meet repentance, seeing they keep on crucifying the Son of God afresh and keep on putting him to an open shame. The apostate no longer believes Jesus is the way to God. How can they come back if they no longer believe he's the way? I have met apostates. I know of a well-known entertainer who made a statement years ago that he knew he had to get back to Jesus Christ, but he wasn't ready to do it yet. And today he no longer believes Jesus is the way to God. And uh, that, 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 that's, that's exactly what an apostate is. No longer believes Jesus is the way. And the Bible warns a Christian about apostasy. Uh, he calls them holy brothers, sharers of the heavenly calling. Beware lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and apostatizing from the living God. And so that can happen. We have those warnings all the way through the New Testament. Now, the main message of the New Testament is God's able to keep you. But if you're away from God tonight and you once knew God and you still know Jesus is the answer, you can come back to him tonight. And he's reaching out to you. He wants you back. You're like the prodigal son. You're like the prodigal daughter. Okay. He wants you back. The apostate no longer believes in Jesus. He, he substituted something else. Substituted something else. And I... I and I've seen on the, 
I, I, you know, on the social media, someone said, well, this is in the Bible in case it could happen, but it can't happen. If it can't happen, why did God put it in the Bible? God doesn't waste words, folks. God doesn't waste words. Peter gives a warning. He, 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 he said you can be like the dog going back to his own vomit and the cell that was washed to his wild ring in the mire. Same thing can happen to you. I'll read the, uh, from the middle of 1 Corinthians 9 on into chapter 10 about the children of Israel starting out from Egypt on the way to Canaan, but they didn't make it. They were already delivered on the way to the promised land, and they fell back into sin. And this is a warning given for us, we are told. And then it goes on to say, there is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not lie to be tempted above what you're able to bear, but will with the temptation make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it, to endure it. Uh, what is postmodernism and how does it differ from previous movements? Well, postmodernism has the idea what's okay for good for you, what's good for me is good for me. There is no absolute truth. Yeah. And they have the following statement the only absolute statement, the only absolute truth is the statement that there is no absolute truth. <laughs> the only absolute truth is the statement that there is no absolute truth. No, the only absolute truth is the absolute truth that there is no absolute truth. Yeah, the only absolute truth is the absolute truth that there is no absolute truth. Nothing is absolute. What you believe is fine for you. What I believe is fine for me it really doesn't matter. That's postmodernism. No, there is a truth. And God has given it to us in his book. And his book is very understandable when you take time to read it. But let me encourage you, if you want to do serious Bible study, get the New American Standard. That is the most accurate English translation of the original we have. Uh, if, you, uh, if you want to read and not do serious Bible study, you can get the New Living Translation because that's the most readable translation we have, but it's not technically a translation. It's what called, uh, it's what is called like the, uh, uh, I know the New International Commentary, the, uh, you know, the New Living Translation and those like that are what you call dynamic equivalent. That means the scholars read what the original said, but then put it in their own words. It isn't a word-for-word -word translation. But for serious Bible study, you need a word-for-word -word translation. And the New American Standard is the most accurate. And also the English Standard is very accurate. Uh, 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 those would be the two most accurate English tra translation we have. The New King James would be the third. But, but the first two are the other two, and they're very accurate. And uh, b -b 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 and I like the reading of uh, and I like the reading of the new uh, New Living Translation. But sometimes it misses the point because it substitutes their own language. Explain about the sins. Oh, oh, uh, in Isaiah, what are the differences between Hezekiah and Ahaz at kings? Uh, uh, how does Hezekiah manage to save both Israel and his own life? How does he prove himself? Well, he takes the issue. You know, Ahaz actually joined the Assyrians. Okay, he actually went to see Ben Hadad, and he he just uh, uh, he sided with the Assyrians and had commune with them, and he actually ended up there. Okay, the Assyrians came down, destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel. He got caught up in it. Well, Hezekiah, when they came down to destroy Jerusalem, he went into the house of the Lord and spread the letter out before the Lord. And God intervened for Jerusalem because of Hezekiah. And, um, uh, you know, Sennacherib came down and he wanted to destroy, he wanted to take Jerusalem. He took all the other cities of Judah. He took them and he'd already conquered the Assyrian Empire. And he came down and he wanted Jerusalem. And he even sent a letter, and Hezekiah spread it out before the Lord. And you can read Isaiah about chapter 36, 37, 38, and 39. I, and Lord prophesied through Isaiah, he will be, he'll be sent back without victory. And he came. And what happened? 180,000 of his army died in one night. 180,000. Sennacherib ruled for 20 more years and never came near Jerusalem again. Never came near Jerusalem again. Okay, he went back. He went back to Assyria. And his kids killed him, right? Pardon? And his kids killed him? Yeah. Yeah, yeah his kids killed him. 
Uh, when Jesus cleanses the temple, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it seems to be in the latter part of his ministry. In John, the beginning, did he do it twice? Yes, he did it twice. Yeah, he cleansed it early, and then he cleansed it again later. Yes, absolutely did it twice. Okay. Uh, I explained about sins that people deliberately do. Well, oh, okay, I already had that. I already answered that question. Okay. Uh, when did the Holy Spirit come to earth? Did the Holy Spirit always dwell in those who were committed to God previous to the crucifixion of Jesus? I ask this question because I read in Luke 2 that the Holy Spirit was on Simeon. And I was always under the impression that Jesus sent the Holy Spirit after his ascension and after defeating the cross. Well, but no, the Holy Spirit's always been here. He's in Genesis. Okay, the Spirit of God flutters on the face of the deep in Genesis 1-3. Uh, and then the Holy Spirit, I'm stammering, stammering again, the Holy Spirit. I'm glad I don't do this when I'm preached. The night the Lord called me to preach, I said, you're kidding, I can't talk. I've preached for over 70 years, never one time from the pulpit, but some days I can't even carry on a conversation. And God promised me when I preach, I would never do that, and I never have. But... Uh, uh, he uh, he was on Moses. How uh, we read that he was on how uh, 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 that actually Bezalel in the Old Testament was filled with the Holy Spirit to make the you know the items for the tabernacle, such as the candlestick and all those kind of things. Uh, the Holy Spirit was on the judges. The Bible says literally the Holy Spirit clothed himself with Gideon. It says the Holy Spirit rushed on Samson. He came upon Samson. He fell upon Samson. The Holy Spirit was on the prophets, okay, all the way through the Old Testament. Micah the prophet says, I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord. And it was the Spirit of the Lord that enabled the prophets to prophesy. He has always been here. Now, Jesus breathed on the apostles, okay, but in the Old Testament, he was only for certain people. Now, since the day of Pentecost, he is for every believer. Every believer, when you receive Jesus, you receive the Holy Spirit. And he comes to live on the inside to enable you to live, live as God wants you to live and also teach you. And, and you know that you're saved because the Holy Spirit bears witness with your spirit. You're a child of God. If you don't have that witness, if you, if you don't know that you're saved, you're not. And so the Bible says the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're children of God. In Galatians, it says we know we've passed from death unto life because he's given us of his spirit. And so, so he comes on the scene there. But he was poured out on all flesh on the day of Pentecost for every believer. Now, the difference between receiving the Holy Spirit and being immersed in the spirit for power. Jesus breathed upon the apostles and uh, in John chapter 20 and said, receive you the Holy Spirit. That was after his resurrection. Okay. But then he told the same apostles, now you need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. That is a baptism of, you'll see power, power for what? Power for ministry, power to be witnesses to me. It's an intensification of the Holy Spirit. And again, the difference is between pouring, you know, water in a cup, the cup has water. You, you have the Holy Spirit within you at salvation. But if I baptize the cup, I put it under the water, and the water has the cup, and I bring it up full and running over. And that's why Jesus said you're going to be baptized, but you read in Acts 2 when it happened, says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Why? They were immersed in the Spirit and began to speak other languages that they didn't know as the Spirit gave them the articulation. And so it, it, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a baptism of power. And you can be baptized with the Holy Spirit anywhere. My mother got baptized with the Holy Spirit in bed, started praising God. God baptized her in the Holy Spirit. I've seen people baptized in the Holy Spirit in so many different places. You start praising God and you feel your lips and tongue begin to quiver. Just let them do what they want to do. You have to furnish your voice. It says they speak, but the Spirit gives the articulation. Okay, he controls the lips and the tongue, but you still have to furnish God a voice. He won't give you a voice. But you start praising God, worshiping God, asking God. You know, Jesus says this at that loose gospel, you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those that keep on asking him? I got so desperate for the power of the Holy Spirit. I, I just get God. I need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. About three months after I met the Lord and he baptized me in the Holy Spirit. 
and it, it made a difference in my life. It made a difference in my life, just like salvation made a difference. It also made a difference. Okay, I've got another one called in. Uh, did Jesus witness to the people in Hades? Uh, did Jesus put Satan on display and take back the keys to death and hell? No, no, I don't think Satan ever had the keys of that. Uh, he just said, I have them. I don't think he made a spectacle and took them back, but, but, but he did open the paradise side of Hades. Okay. Uh, he, I know the phrase, b -b -b uh, the phrase by which he speak on, which he spoke under the spirits in prison. Uh, if you read the context of that in first Peter chapter three, he is indicating that the same spirit that is moving today was the same spirit that moved in the book of Genesis, okay? The same spirit that was speaking to the prisoners that are now in prison, that same spirit in Genesis. And it's a, it's one of the most difficult passages in the Bible, but, 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 but he's trying to explain the purpose of baptism. Okay, let me turn over to 1 Peter chapter 3, and this is a verse that's pulled out of context, okay? This is a verse that's pulled out of context. First Peter chapter three. Uh, for Christ also has suffered in the flesh. I'm sorry, Christ also has suffered once for sins. I, I'm stammering again, the righteous for the unrighteous that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the spirit by which he went and preached to the spirits in prison, which sometimes were disobedient. Okay, well, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. In other words, the same spirit that made Christ alive is the same one that says in Genesis 6, my spirit will not always strive with man. Waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing, wherein few eight souls were saved through water. The King James says by water. No, the water didn't save them. The fact that they passed through the water demonstrated they were saved people. And he goes on to say the like figure wherein to baptism to save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Christ. In other words, the fact that you're willing to be baptized indicates that you've received Jesus Christ. That baptism doesn't save you. All right. The fact that they passed through the water indicated they were God's people. The fact that you're willing to pass through the water Okay, it indicates that you're one of God's people. You're not saved by being baptized. That's why Peter said it doesn't put away the filth of the flesh. If you haven't received Jesus Christ, it doesn't do any good to be baptized. It's meaningless. Okay, meaningless. We're not saved by water baptism. We're saved by the relationship. He that has the son has life. He that doesn't have the son does not have life. Baptism is an act of obedience to God. And so that scripture is pulled out of context. He's merely saying the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is the same spirit back there, but he's trying to get at the purpose of baptism through all this. And he, and he has a very complicated way of doing it. So you've got to read the whole passage there to see what's going on. Okay, and the Greek preposition, they were saved through the water. It's the Greek preposition D-I-A that we get our word diameter from. Okay, and it means through. Uh, okay. Let's see, a lot, of, a lot of leaders teach generational curses. Is there a scripture that talks about why this isn't true? Yes, generational curses are contrary to scripture. You, you don't see one example in the book of Acts or in any of the letters of the New Testament or even in Jesus praying for anyone for a generational curse. All right. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians, uh, I, I stammer again, 5.17, five, five, if anyone be in Christ, they are a new creation. Old things are passed away and all things have become new. If all things have become new, what can how can there be a generational curse? And again, you never see one occasion in the New Testament where anyone is praying against a generational curse. Or you don't see any exhortation against a generational curse. You do have an exhortation to be an example to your children. We're going to follow in your footsteps and not talking about generational curse. He'll, the Old Testament says he'll visit the iniquity under the third and fourth generation of them that hate him. 
but he'll also visit, visit his blessing of the first generation of those that love him. How does that happen? By parents' influence. You read about the influence. The Bible says in Judges, there arose another generation that knew not the Lord, neither yet the works he'd done for Israel. Whose fault was it? The parents who had lost the touch of God on their lives. And a lot of what's going on our, in our country is that reason. You know, when they took the Ten Commandments out of school, and the Anti-Christian Liars Union, I calls it, tries to tell schools you can't sing carols at Christmas time. Yes, you can. The Supreme Court says that child does not lose the right of free speech when they go into the classroom. And it also also said they can sing Christmas carols as long as they're singing other type of music too at Christmas time. But the, the ACLU comes in and buffaloes schools and tells them they can't do it. You know, thank God we've got we've got some Christian attorneys that meet them head on. And uh, and you absolutely can do it. So don't let the I, I, I don't let the lies of the enemy buffalo you. And so it's you know we go through all these kinds of difficulties, but we live in the closing hours of time, folks. The things the Bible says were going to happen, uh, like Paul says in in Romans chapter thirteen, knowing the time, and now it's high time to wake out of our sleep. And we need to look up and see what's going on around the world. We need to recognize that Jesus Christ is coming soon. Prophecies of the Bible are taking place at warp speed. Things they talked about for hundreds of years are happening right now. Okay. If you could eat lunch with one Bible person, who would it be? Jesus not included. Oh, boy, I've never thought about that. It would probably be Paul. Probably the Apostle Paul. At uh, yeah, he he inspires me, but the whole Bible inspires me. Whole Bible inspires me. By the way, let me encourage you to be faithful to your church. Okay, I, I, you need to be there on Sunday. I know it's good to watch online, but not the same as being there. There is something when the body of Christ is together, the Spirit of God moves and touches lives. If you want your church to grow, invite someone to go with you this Sunday to your church. Say, come hear my pastor preach. Come meet the people at my church. We have a great church. We have a friendly church. Please come and get acquainted. I'll be glad to pick you up if you want me to. Just let me encourage you to be my guest this Sunday. Churches grow because people take people to hear their pastor preach. So let me encourage you to take your to take people to hear your pastor preach. You know, Sheffield, when I took it, had a it actually had less than 200 adults and about 100 bus children. And because our people started bringing people, someone publicly accepted the Lord every Sunday for 33 years. Every single Sunday. Every single Sunday. The church was averaging about 6,500. It, it became the largest multicultural church in mid-America because people were bringing people to church. And that's what you need to do for your church. You need to take someone to church with you, and you need to be there yourself. You know, the pandemic has hurt hurt people being in the house of God. You need to be there. You need to have your children there. Uh, one of the questions I, I, I remember seeing, okay, how do you teach a four- or five-year-old or a child between four and eight about the Bible? You get them books of Bible stories. Bible stories, and you take them to Sunday school, and you take them to junior church at your church. And I'm sure your church has one. So let me encourage you to do that too. But get them some good, simple Bible story books. I got some that even have characters that stand the up. Bible. The Illustrated it's Bible. Is that the one to get for that age? It's a good one, yeah. Okay, ages four to eight? Yeah, I'd say, yeah, eight or eight. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you mentioned the Illustrated Bible. And uh, But you got to be faithful and take him to church. And you... And the Bible says, train a child up in the way he should go. When he's old, he won't depart. That doesn't mean to tell them. It means to show them. Take them by the hand. We're going to church on Sunday. We're going to be there every Sunday we can. Okay? And we're going to, we're going to tell other people about Jesus. And I'm going to tell you about Jesus. And we're going to read stories about Jesus. Okay? And there's some great, great children's books. Be faithful to your church with tithes and offerings. Your church has ministries that they help support missionaries and other things like that. Now, if you're in the Kansas City area and you don't have a church home, we'll invite you to Sheffield Family Life Center. We're in the inner city of Kansas City, Missouri. Okay. And we have service at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock on Sunday. And for both services, we have nursery and children's department and youth department. All the various departments are open. Okay. The youth go to the gym. I, I, 
you know, for the nine o'clock service. And then at 11, they come into the main auditorium for that service. But, but, but we have adult Sunday school classes, you know, at nine o'clock. And then at 11 o'clock, we have, we have service. We have service at nine and 11. Okay, nurseries, children's departments are all open for everything. At the nine o'clock service, we have children's uh, Sunday school classes. At the 11 o'clock service, we have what's called Sheffield Kids. It's like a super church. Okay, we have places for every age. And then Wednesday night, I know from 7 to 8.30, we have family night. I teach in the chapel. Okay, I'm currently in Romans chapter 13 in the adult Bible study. And then we have a married couples fellowship going on. We have the youth in the, in the youth center gym. We have a young adult service. I believe the young adults is 18 to 35. Uh, in my class, any age can come in, but, but we're there to teach the Bible. And we have a family night. Our nurseries are open. Our children's department. <laughs> they have roll rangers and missionettes for the boys and girls. They have a place for every member of your family from 7 to 8.30 on Wednesday nights. And so if you don't have a church home, we invite you to come worship with us. And you can check our website at sflc.net. If you don't know Jesus Christ, just play this prayer. Father, Father, I know I've sinned. I ask you to forgive me in Jesus' name. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and be Lord of my life. I receive you as my personal Savior. I give you my life. Help me to live for you from now on. Help me to find a good Bible-believing church. Help me to understand your word. Help me to tell others about your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, I pray you'll seal this in people's hearts. And by the way, if you want to send your questions in for next week, it's drgwwjr at gmail.com. drgwwjr at gmail.com. Thank you for watching. God bless you. Have a great week in Jesus.